Quittant le port, Ulysse gagne par un sentier rocailleur sur les hauteurs, à travers le paysage boisé, le lieu où Athénée lui avait indiqué la demeure de l'excellent porcher, qui sort le bien du maître, veillant mieux que tout autre parmi les serviteurs acquis par l'illustre Ulysse. Il le trouva assis devant l'entrée de la cabane, là où s'était construit une cœur enterré d'un haut mur, en lieu découvert, grand et beau, en forme de cercle. Lui-même l'avait bâti pour ses portes après le départ du roi, sans consulter sa maîtresse ni le vieux Léart. Il avait apporté les pierres et par-dessus disposé des épines. À l'extérieur, il avait fait courir de but en but une palacette de gros pieds serrés, en bois de chêne dont il avait ôté l'écorce noire. Et à l'intérieur de la cour, il avait bâti deux étables, l'une à côté de l'autre, pour servir de litière aux tuyaux, dont chacune était enfermée, cinquante tuyaux qui couchaient à même le sol. Ses femelles avaient mis bas. Les mâles dormaient dehors. Il était beaucoup moins nombreux. Les divins prétendants, en les mangeant, ont diminué le nombre, car le porcher leur envoyait toujours le meilleur de tous les porcs à l'engrais. Il n'en avait plus que 360, et ceux veillaient toujours, pareils à des fauves, quatre chiens, élevés par le chef des porchers. Humers himself was then applied in cutting forth a fair-hued ox's hide to fit his feet with shoes. His servants held guard of his swine. Three here and there at field, the fourth he sent to city with the sow, which must of force be offered to the vow the wooers made to all society, to serve which still they did those offerings ply. The fate-born dogs to bark took sudden view of Odysseus, and upon him flew with open mouth. He, cunning to appall a fierce dog's fury, from his hand let fall his staff to earth, and sat him careless down. And yet to him had one foul wrong been shown, where most his right lay, had not instantly the herdsman let his side fall, and his cry, with frequent stones, flung at the dogs, repelled, this way and that, their eager course they held. When through the entry passed, he thus did mourn. Unhappy stranger, thus the faithful swain began, with accent gracious and humane. What sorrow had been mine if at my gate thy reverend age had met a shameful fate? Enough of woes already have I known, enough my master's sorrows and my own. While here, ungrateful task, his herds I feed, ordained for lawless rioters to bleed, perhaps supported at another's board. Far from his country roams my hapless lord, or sighed in exile forth his latest breath, now covered with the eternal shade of death. But enter this, my homely roof, and see our woods, not void of hospitality. Then tell me whence thou art, and what the share of woes and wanderings thou wert born to bear. He said, and seconding the kind request, with friendly step proceeds his unknown guest. A shaggy goat soft hide beneath him spread, and with fresh rushes heaped an ample bed. Jove touched the hero's tender soul to find so just reception from a heart so kind. And, O oh ye gods, with all your blessings grace, he thus broke forth, this friend of human race. Stranger, may Zeus and the other immortal gods give you what you most wish for, as you welcomed me with an open mind. In reply, the swineherd Eumaeus said, My guest, I should sin if I failed in attention to any stranger, even one poorer than yourself. 
the needy, and the strangers are all from Zeus. And with the likes of us, a quite slender gift can convey goodwill. For alas, the state of bondmen is never wholly free from fear when their lords and masters are young. My proper lord has, I think, been denied his return home by the gods. Surely he would have favored me with the endowment a good master gives his housemen, things like a cottage with its scrap of garden and a prudent woman, in reward for faithful labor whose fruits God has multiplied and blessed as he has blessed and multiplied my unremitting toil. Indeed, my Lord would have largely benefited me as years came upon him in the house. But he has perished, and I would that every one of Helen's kind might be beaten to the knee and broken in revenge for all the manhood she has undone. See you, my master was one of those who went to Ilium of the goodly horses to fight the Trojans for Agamemnon's fair name. Eat now, my guest, such lean swine as are meat for us poor swains, the fat the wooers eat, in whose minds no shame, no remorse doth move, though well they know the blessed gods do not love ungodly actions, but respect the right, and in the works of pious men delight. But these are worse than impious, for those that vow to injustice and profess them foes to other nations, enter on their land, and Jupiter, to shew his punishing hand upon the invaded for their penance then, gives favour to their foes, though wicked men, to make their prey on them, who, having freight their ships with spoil enough, weigh anchor straight, and each man to his house. And yet even these, thus powerful fear of God's just vengeance sees, even for that prize in which they so rejoice. But these men, knowing, having heard the voice of God by some means, that sad death hath reft the ruler here, will never suffer left their unjust wooing of his wife, nor take her often answer, and their own roofs make their fit retreats. But since unchecked they may, they therefore will, make still his goods their prey without all spare or end. There is no day nor night sent out from God that ever they profane with one beast's blood, or only two, but more make spoil of, and the wrongs they do in meet success to wine as well extend, which as excessively their riots spend. Sache que notre maître avait la vie très large. Ni sur ce continent dont la côte noircit, ni dans Ita que même aucun autre héros n'avait aussi grand train. Il se mettrait à vin sans égaler son bien. Veux-tu savoir le compte En terre ferme, il a douze troupeaux de vaches, tout autant de moutons, en même nombre aussi les bandes de cochons et les hardes de chèvres que font paître là-bas des bergers à sa solde ou des hôtes à lui. Ici, dans notre Ithaque, et son armée de chèvres, onze hardes en tout, qu'à l'autre bout de l'île garde d'honnêtes gens. Eux aussi, chaque jour, doivent aux prétendants envoyer une bête en prenant le meilleur de leurs chevreaux dodus. Et tu me vois garder et défendre ces ports dont, chaque jour, je dois leur fournir le plus beau Il disait. Mais Ulysse, avalant prestement les viandes et le vin, à grands coups, sans maudire, et songeant à planter des mots aux prétendants, se restaurait le cœur. Le repas terminé, Eumé emplit de vin la tasse où il buvait et la tendit au maître. Ulysse l'accepta et, d'un cœur plus joyeux, il lui dit, élevant la voix, ses mots ailés. Oh, « Ô caro, qui te comprò que suoi beni, così ricco et potente, comme tu dici Raconti que est morto per l'onore d'Agamennone. Ma dimmi il suo nome, se mai lo conobbi, un re così grande. Sa Zeus et gli altri nomi immortali, se avendolo visto... Posso darne notizia. Ho molto girato. E 
e gli rispose il porcaio, capo d'uomini. Vecchio, nessun giramondo che venga qui a darne notizia può ormai persuadere la sua donna e il figlio, perché variamente, avendo bisogno d'aiuto, i girovaghi mentono e non pensano certo a raccontare cose vere. Chiunque, errando, arriva tra il popolo d'Itaca, va dalla mia padrona e le spaccia menzogne. E lei fa buona accoglienza, l'ospita, chiede ogni cosa e tra i singhiozzi le cadono giù dagli occhi le lacrime, come costume di donna, quando le è morto lo sposo lontano. Tu pure, subito, vecchio, fabbricheresti frottole se un mantello, una tunica, se vesti ti dessero. No, rapide cagni e uccelli han già strappato la pelle dalle sue ossa. L'ha abbandonato, la vita. O forse in mare lo divorarono i pesci e le sue ossa giacciono sulla riva di molta sabbia coperte. È morto così, chissà dove. E strazio, per sempre, ai suoi amici tutti. Ma a me soprattutto ne è nato. Mai più troverò, dovunque vada, un così dolce signore, nemmeno se ritornassi a casa del padre e della madre dove son nato, ed essi mi crebbero. Ebbene, per essi non piango altrettanto, per quanto bramoso di rivederli con gli occhi nella terra dei padri. Ma il desiderio del lontano Odissio mi soggioga. A nominarlo, straniero, benché non ci sia, ho riverenza. Molto mamava e mi curava di cuore. E io lo chiamo fratello, benché sia lontano. Him answered then, the hero toil inured. My friend, since his return in thy account is an event impossible, and thy mind always incredulous that hope rejects, I shall not slightly speak, but with an oath. Ulysses comes again, and I demand no more than that the boon such news deserves be given me soon, as he shall reach his home. Then give me vest and mantle fit to wear, which, ere that hour, much as I need them both, I neither ask nor will accept from thee. For him whom poverty can force aside from truth, I hate him as the gates of hell. Be, Jove, of all in heaven my witness first. Then this thy hospitable board and, last, the household gods of the illustrious chief himself. Ulysses, to whose gates I go. That all my words shall surely be fulfilled, in this same year Ulysses shall arrive. This month closed, another month succeed, he shall return, and punish all who dare insult his consort and his noble son. Eumaeus, the swineherd, you answered him then, saying, There's no way I'll ever be able to reward you for that good news, old man. Odysseus will never return. Drink in peace and let's turn our thoughts to other things instead. Stop reminding me of it all. My heart grieves so whenever anyone speaks of my good master. As for your oath, let it rest, and may Odysseus return as I desire. I and Penelope, and Laertes, that old man, and divine Telemachus. Telemachus, the son, he is the one I grieve for endlessly now. The gods made him grow like a young sapling. And I thought he'd be like his brave and handsome father in action. But some man or god addled his mind, and foolishly, he went to sacred Pylos seeking news. Those princely suitors will ambush him on his way home, and godlike Arcasius' race will vanish from Ithaca, traceless. Whether he's taken or escapes, there's nothing we can do, though. May Zeus, son of Cronos, reach out a hand to save him. But tell me of your own troubles, old man. Tell me in truth, so I may clearly know it, who you are and where you come from. Who are your parents, and where's your city? What sort of ship was it that brought you to Ithaca, since one can't get here on foot? Where did its crew claim to be from?
In reply, many-minded Odysseus said, I will speak about these things truthfully. Lie upon this land within your house with food and sweet wine, divided silently while others work. Since I would not easily finish my story in an entire year, speaking about the trials of my spirit, my suffering for the will of the gods. I say solemnly that I was born and raised in Crete, the place that reaches far and wide. My father was a well-to-do man who had many sons born in marriage, whereas I was the son of a slave whom he had purchased for a concubine. Nevertheless, my father Castor, son of Hylax, whose lineage I claim, and who was held in the highest honour in the locale of the Cretans for his wealth, prosperity, and the valour of his sons, put me on the same level with my brothers who had been born in wedlock. When, however, death took him to the house of Hades, his sons divided his estate and cast lots for their shares. But to me they gave a holding and little else. Nevertheless, my excellence enabled me to marry into a rich family, for I was not given to bragging or shirking on the field of battle. It is all over now. Still, if you look at the straw, you can see what the ear was, for I have had trouble enough and to spare. Ares and Athena made me doughty in war when I had picked my men to surprise the enemy with an ambassade, I never gave death so much as a thought, but was the first to leap forward and spear all whom I could overtake. That was the fighting me, but labor I never could abide nor the husbandry which breeds healthy children. My fancies were set upon galleys and wars, pikes and burnished javelins, the deadly toys that bring shivers to men of ordinary mold. I think such tastes came to me from heaven. Each man sports the activity he enjoys. Before the prime of Achaea went up to battle against Troy, I had nine times commanded men and warships on foreign expeditions, at a great profit to myself, with the leader's first choice of the booty to increase my individual share. So my house rapidly filled with wealth, and I became formidable and respected among the Cretans. Consequently, when far-seeing Zeus finally imagined this dread course, which has enfeebled the knees of so many men, People clamored for me and for famous Idomeneus to lead their fleet to Ilium. And so firmly was the popular mind made up that we had no option. Wherefore, we sons of the Achaeans stayed fighting for nine years. In the tenth, we sacked Priam city and afterwards embarked for a home, a god dispersing the host. Je n'avais pas joui un mois de mes enfants, de la femme, de ma jeunesse et de mes biens, que l'envie me prenait d'équiper des navires et d'aller en croisière avec mes compagnons divins dans l'Égyptos. J'équipe neuf vaisseaux et les hommes affluent. Six jours, ces braves gens font bombance chez moi. C'est moi qui, sans compter, fournissais les victimes, tant pour offrir aux dieux que pour servir à table. Le septième, on embarque des plaines de Crète, un bel et plein boré nous emmène tout droit comme au courant d'un fleuve. À bord, pas d'avarie, ni maladie, ni mort. On n'avait qu'à s'asseoir et qu'à laisser mener le vent et les pilotes. Cinq jours, et nous entrons au beau fleuve Égyptos. Je fais entrer tous mes vaisseaux aux deux gaillards dans le fleuve Égyptos. Tung ego, 
fideli socios iusi, illico prope naves manere atqui classim custodide, et explorates ut speculas peterent imperavi, comites autem libidine querentes animis que propti sagitati, statem aegypti hominum opulatos agros vastaverunt, Vidis caecis et mulieres et pavolos infantes lapuerent, quitus ad urbem pervenit clamor, cum strepitum ad visent, prima luce processerunt, et totum campus plenus peditum, equitum, ac splendoris aeris erat, sed Jupiter donans fuga malam nostri socis injecit, neque ulus contra manere ausit est. Undique enim malum nos circumdedit. Sic plores nostrum acri aere occiderunt, et ceteros ad urbem vivos duxerunt, ut illis per vim laborare cogerento. Sed in corde meo, Jupiter ipse, hanc sententiam ponuit, utinam perissem, ac illic in Aegypto factum obisem. Conia me miseria excepit. Zeus, however, put it in my mind to do thus, and I wish I had died then and there in Egypt instead, for there was much sorrow in store for me. I took off my helmet and shield and dropped my spear from my hand. Then I went straight up to the king's chariot, clasped his knees and kissed them, whereon he spared my life, bade me get into his chariot and took me weeping into his own home. Many made at me with their ashen spears and tried to kill me in their fury, but the king protected me for he feared the anger of Zeus, the protector of strangers, who punishes those who do evil. I stayed there for seven years and got together much wealth among the Egyptians, for they all gave me something. But when it was now going on for eight years, there came a certain Phoenician, a cunning rascal, who had already committed all sorts of villainy, and this man talked me over into going with him to Phoenicia, where his house and his possessions lay. I stayed there for a whole twelve months, but at the end of that time, when months and days had gone by, till the same season had come round again, he set me on board a ship bound for Libya on a pretense that I was to take a cargo along with him to that place, but really that he might sell me as a slave and take the wealth I fetched. I suspected his intention, but went on board with him, for I could not help it. The ship ran before a fresh north wind till we had reached the sea that lies between Crete and Libya. There, however, Zeus counselled their destruction. Sed quando cretam reliquimus, nec alia terra, nisi caelum mare que apparuit, tum vere cronides nubem atram imposuit supernauem cavam, et pontus infra nicuruit. Juperta simultonuit, ac flum, fulmen in nauem diecit, quae fulgore jovis percusa tota tremuit, et fumo solfero impleta est. Omnes itaque de nave precipites ceciderunt, et similis corincibus circum trabes atras vecti sunt. Sic is, Deus, reditum suum domum abstulit. Meis autem, Jupiter itse, quam vis dolore meo corde tulerim, malum robustum prodae pulae in manibus ponuit, ut adhuc leto evaderem. Ita hunc 
ad haisi, et sairis ventis vectus sunt, posquam novem dies jactatus sum, decem nocte obscura, teram thesprotiensum, me magnus fluctus volubilis ad tulit. Illic me thespotianum rex, heros peron, sine pretio acepit, nam me filius delectus sus, apropinquavit, algu aerumnaque fessum, et me manu atolens domum duxit, donec regiam patris avenit, me hic laina tunicaque vestavi. It was there I heard of Odysseus. The king said he'd welcomed him and showed him hospitality as he headed for home. And he showed me the wealth Odysseus had garnered, gold and bronze and forged iron, so great a pile that what was stored in the king's treasury would feed a man and his heirs to the tenth generation. Odysseus, he said, had left for Dodona to learn Zeus's will from the great, great oak tree sacred to the god. As to how he should return, openly or in secret, to Ithaca's rich isle after his long absence. Moreover, as he poured libations in his house in my presence, he swore that a ship and crew were standing by to carry Odysseus to his native land. That he sent me off first, since a Thesprotian vessel was setting out for corn rich Dolichium. He ordered the crew to treat me with kindness and take me to Acastus, its king. But they were all possessed of an evil thought, and the result to me was utter misery. When the seagoing ship was far from land, they set about reducing me to slavery. They stripped me of my garments, my mantle and a doublet, and changed my raiment to a vile wrap and doublet, tattered garments, even those you see now before you. And in the evening they reached the fields of clear seen Ithaca. There in the decked ship they bound me closely with a twisted rope, and themselves went ashore, and hurried to take supper by the sea banks. Meanwhile the gods themselves lightly unclasped my bands, and muffling my head with the wrap, I slid down the smooth landing plank and set my breast to the sea and rode hard with both hands as I swam. And very soon I was out of the water and beyond their reach. Then I went up where there was a thicket, a wood in full leaf, and lay there crouching. And they went here and there, making great moan, but when now it seemed to them little avail to go further on their quest, they departed back again aboard their hollow ship. And the gods themselves hid me easily and brought me nigh to the homestead of a wise man, for still, I think, I am ordained to live on. Then you made answer to him, swineherd Eumaeus, Ah, wretched guest, you have truly stirred my heart with the tale of all these things, of your sufferings and your wanderings. Yet herein, I think, you speak a lie, and never will you persuade me with the tale about Odysseus. Why should one in your plight lie in vain? Well I know of mine own self, as touching my Lord's return, that he was utterly hated by all the gods, in that they smote him not among the Trojans, nor in the arms of his friends, when he had wound up the clue of war. So should the whole Achaean host have built him a barrow, yea, and for his son would he have won great glory in the after days. So, it is that I hold myself withdrawn here amongst my pigs, never visiting the city except when bidden by circumspect Penelope to hear some news which is casually blown in. Then, how they sit round and ply the talebearer with questions, not merely those who sorrow for their absent lord, but also those others who are enjoying a free run of their teeth in his substance. Only I have lacked heart to query or chop questions. Since that day, an Aetolian cheated me with his tale. 
He had killed his man and wandered over the face of the earth till he reached my place. I tended him with all kindness, and he told me he had seen Odysseus in Crete with Edomineus, patching his storm-battered ships. By the summer or at harvest time, he would be back, he said, enriched with his noble following. But you, old misery whom fortune has brought to my door, have no need of lies to ingratiate yourself or to warm my heart. That is no road to my regard and charity, which derive from fear of Zeus, the stranger's patron, and from pity for yourself. Ulysse l'avisé lui fit cette réponse. En vérité réside dans ta poitrine un cœur bien incrédule. Même un sermon ne peut t'ébranler, et je n'arrive pas à te convaincre. Voyons, faisons un pari, mais il faut que là-haut, nous soient témoins les dieux qui règnent sur l'Olympe. Si le Seigneur, ton maître, revient en cette maison, tu me rêves d'un manteau, d'une tunique, et tu me fais conduire à Dulition, où mon cœur avait tant envie d'aller. Et si ton maître ne vient pas, comme je prétends, tu exciteras tes serviteurs et me jeter du haut de la grande roche, pour qu'aucun entre mon dion ne s'avise plus de te tromper par ses flatteurs artifices. En repense, l'excellent porcher lui disait, « Hôte, ce serait le vrai moyen de m'assurer, parmi les hommes, une bonne réputation et un renom de mérite, à la fois pour le présent et pour l'avenir. Quoi, je t'aurais conduit dans ma cabane et tu aurais fait les présents d'hospitalité pour te tuer ensuite, t'enlever le doux souffle de la vie. Je pourrais, après ce forfait, implorer Zeus, fils de Cronos. Mais c'est maintenant l'heure du souper. Je voudrais que mes compagnons fussent au plus tôt à l'intérieur pour préparer dans la cabane un délectable repas. And as they spoke such things to one another, the swineherds and the pigs drew near. They shut away the pigs, and an unspeakable clamor arose from the courtyard. The good swineherd called to his companions, Bring the best pig, so I can slaughter it for this guest from another land, and we will help him. Enduring, we have the miserable job of caring for these white-toothed pigs, while others eat our labor. As he spoke, he ruthlessly split wood with a bronze ax. Les autres amenaient un bord de belle graisse, un cochon de cinq ans que l'on mit aussitôt debout sur le foyer, et le porcher n'oublia pas les immortels. C'était un bon esprit. Du porc aux blanches dents, quand il eut prélevé quelques poils de la hure, qu'il jeta dans la flamme en invoquant les dieux pour que le sage Ulysse revint en sa maison. Il assomma la bête d'une bûche de chêne qu'il n'avait pas fendue, et l'âme s'envola. Saigné, flambé, le porc fut vite dépecé, et, sur les viandes crues qu'il détachait des membres, le porcher étendit un large champ de graisse, puis jeta dans le feu ses tranches saupoudrées d'une fine farine, et le reste coupé menu fut mis aux broches. Quand tout fut cuit à point, lorsque, tiré du feu, le rôti fut dressé sur les planches à pain, le porcher se leva et fit les parts. C'était le plus juste des cœurs. Il mit tout au partage et prépara sept lots. Le premier qu'il offrit avec une prière fut pour le fils de Zeus, Hermès, et pour les nymphes. Il en servit un autre à chacun des convives, mais garda pour Ulysse les filets allongés, du porc aux blanches dents et cette part d'honneur remplie de joie à le maître. Ulysse l'avisé prit alors la parole. I hope, Eumaeus, said he, that Zeus will be as well disposed towards you as I am for the respect you are showing to an outcast like myself. To this, you answered, O oh, swineherd Eumaeus, eat my good man, and enjoy your supper such as it is. A god grants this, 
and withholds that. Just as he thinks right, for he can do whatever he chooses. As he spoke, he cut off the first piece and offered it as a burnt sacrifice to the immortal gods. Then he made them a drink offering, put the cup in the hands of Odysseus, ransacker of cities, and sat down to his own portion. Mesolius brought them their bread. The swineherd had bought this man on his own account from among the Taphians during his master's absence and had paid for him with his own wealth without saying anything either to his mistress or old Lartes. They then laid their hands upon the good things that were before them and when they had had enough to eat and drink, Mesolius took away what was left of the bread and they all went to bed after having made a hearty supper. Then Odysseus spoke among them, making trial of the swineherd, to see whether he would strip off his own cloak and give it to him, or tell some other of his comrades to do so, since he cared for him so greatly. Hear me now, Eumaeus, and all the rest of you, his men, while I tell a boasting tale. For the wine bids me, the fooling wine, which sets one, even though he be very wise, to singing and soft laughter, and makes him stand up and dance, and sometimes brings forth a word which were better left unspoken. Still, since I have once spoken out, I will hide nothing. Would that I were young, and my strength firm, as when we made ready our ambush and led it beneath the walls of Troy. The leaders were Odysseus and Menelaus, son of Atreus, and with them I was third in command, for so they ordered it themselves. Now, when we had come to the city and the steep wall, round about the town and the thick brushwood among the reeds and swampland we lay, crouching beneath our arms, and night came on, Foul, when the north wind had fallen and frosty, and snow came down on us from above, covering us like frost, bitter cold, and ice formed upon our shields. Now all the rest had cloaks and tunics, and slept in peace, with their shields covering their shoulders. But I, when I set out, had left my cloak behind with my comrades in my folly, for I did not think that even so I should be cold and had come with my shield alone and my bright metal belt. Ma quando fu un terzo di notte, le stelle tramontavano, allora Odisseo che mi era accanto parlai col gomito urtandolo, e subito mi sentì. Divino la Erziade, ingegnoso Odisseo, presto non sarò più tra i vivi, ma la tempesta mi uccide, non ho mantello. Un Dio il malpensiero mi dava di venirmene in tunica, e ormai non c'è più rimedio. Dicevo così, e subito questo piano ebbe nell'animo, come era lui per dar consigli e per battersi. Sussurrando pianissimo mi disse parola, zitto adesso, che non ti senta nessun altro che io. Disse, e alzò la testa sul gomito e parlò forte parola. Sentite, amici, divino nel sonno un sogno veduto. Troppo lontano dalle navi avanzammo, ma uno vada a dire alla trida Gamennone, pastore di schiere, se dalle navi spinge altri a raggiungerci. Parlò così. Alzò Toante, figlio d'Andremone. Rapido lasciò il mantello di porpora e prese a correre verso le navi. Così io, nel suo panno, mi sdraiai con piacere. E poi l'aurora, trono d'oro splendette. Oh, fossi giovane ancora, se avessi intatta la forza. Mi darebbe un mantello qualcuno in casa qui le porcai, per due ragioni, per amicizia e per rispetto d'un forte. Così mi disprezzano, vestito di stracci. And Eumaeus answered, Old man, you have told us an excellent story, and have said nothing so far but what is quite satisfactory. For the present, therefore, you shall want neither clothing nor anything else that a stranger in distress may reasonably expect. But tomorrow morning you will have to shake your own old rags about your body again, for we have not many spare cloaks nor shirts up here. 
every man has only one. When Ulysses' son comes home again, he will give you both cloak and shirt and send you wherever you may want to go. With that, he sprang up and set a bed for Odysseus near the fire, and thereon he cast skins of sheep and goats. There Odysseus laid him down, and Eumaeus cast a great thick mantle over him, which he had ever by him for a change of covering when any terrible storm should arise. So there Odysseus slept, and the young men slept beside him. But the swineherd had no mind to lie there in a bed away from the boars. So he made him ready to go forth, and Odysseus was glad, because he had a great care for his master's substance while he was afar. First he cast his sharp sword about his strong shoulders. Then he clad him in a very thick mantle to keep the wind away. And he caught up the fleece of a great and well-fed goat and seized his sharp javelin to defend him against dogs and men. Then he went to lay him down, even where the white-tusked boars were sleeping, beneath the hollow of the rock, in a place of shelter from the north wind. <laughs> 